Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and tonight we're talking to Eric Larson, author of In the Garden of the Beasts. We sat down at Third Place Books in Lake Forest Park and talked about journalism, history, and about Nazis before they were monsters. Enjoy. One of the prime rationalizations or justifications that I gave myself for going into journalism and not simply plunging in and doing the cold turkey writing in a garret somewhere while, you know, while cutting grass or something, um, was that here I'd be actually writing, but I'd also be able to see and meet all kinds of people. And believe me, that paid off because, um, you know, hanging around, hanging, I, I always thought I would want to, uh, first thing I would want to write would be a literate um, mystery or detective story, you know, and, and hanging around with cops is the best way. Another nice thing about it was that it, it, I was very, very shy, painfully shy in high school and, and, and I think in, in college. And journalism, you can't be shy. You've got to get out. You've got to do the cold calls and all that stuff. And that really helped me engage the world on a very different level. The first book that really sort of broke out for me, quote unquote, was Isaac Storm. And that became a, a, a bestseller and did very well. Um, and not just in terms of, of critics and so forth, but also in terms of revenue. I was able to quit my day job, you know, with, with that book. But it was with The Devil in the White City that something kind of miraculous happened, you know, that thing that you can't predict. And, and I'll tell you the truth, I, what makes it even more stunning to me is the fact that on the eve of the publication of that book, um, I was pretty convinced that my career was over. Be, yeah, yeah, because, uh, I know it sounds weird, but because here you had this book that was breaking all the narrative rules. It had these, these two narrative engines that never really, never really collided. It was like two stories side by side in the same book. And yet, something happened. And uh, I, I have people come up to me now, and I, I'm still stunned. I still don't, I'm not sure I quite believe them, but I have people come up to me at these, these book signings and say, you know, Devil White City is my favorite book of all time. I'm like, well, you know, there are other books out there. Like, <laughs> Sun Also Rises, you know, The Maltese Falcon. I mean, there are, there's a lot out there. <laughs> I think I'd make a lousy novelist because it's hard for me to visit pain and, and agony on other people. And it's hard especially to make it up, you know. Um, but when you have people who have these nuanced um, um, uh, characters. I mean, for example, Martha, yeah, she's a little bit of an anti-Semite. Yeah, she's painfully naive in the beginning. She does, however, undergo a transformation that is almost novelistic in form. But to me, it's precisely the quirks and the, and the, the warts that make, make it interesting. Um, her father, who is the second main character in the thing, um, same, kind of, same kind of problem. You know, as I point out um, somewhere in the book, that you know there are no there are no Schindlers um, in this in this book, um, and I didn't try to make them Schindlers um, because then you would be adjusting history, but I find them very compelling as a pair, and through them, um, th this world of 1933-34 becomes, I, I think, very vivid, and also you can appreciate the complexity and you can appreciate can appreciate things that if you didn't look at this period through them, you wouldn't ever understand or know. We want to keep the monsters, and part of the thing about this book is that, I mean, you get a glimpse of, of, of what ultimately got carried forward to make the monsters, but also you, you see them, you see them um, as people who were not perceived as monsters at the time. I mean, even Hitler was not perceived as a monster off base, a little bit wacko, or a lot wacko, depending on your, your perspective, but, you know, even Dodd felt that Hitler was somebody who could be reasoned with. Right. <laughs> and we know, <laughs> the, the, the overall effect for me, and, and as it turns out for, for, for readers, that, that I find so fascinating, the narrative tension thing, is that readers who know what happened are looking back, they're seeing these people behave in a certain way, and they're saying, don't do that. Don't go down to that basement. <laughs> I think actually the best advice is to write every day, and I don't think people do it, and I don't think they understand that that's what it's about. And it's not about writing 10 hours a day, it's about writing 
you know, an hour and a half a day, every day, seven days a week. I mean, that is the key thing. I, I am absolutely convinced. But, you know, you're talking about somebody who's actually already had their first book done. I guess the thing that I would, I, I would, I would say at that point is, you know, think very hard about what the next book is because, you know, don't jump right into something. Don't take the first idea that comes along. Let it gestate for a while um, because, well, for a variety of reasons. One, you know, you, you are going to have to live with it again for however many years, but also suddenly people are maybe watching you, you know. Suddenly your publisher is thinking about you, and if you have another book that does better than your first, you're, what, you're doing what they refer to as tracking. Tracking is a good thing. That's where we, one book sells this much, the next book sells this much, the next book sells this much. And that's a good thing. So you've got to think hard about your ideas. You know? Think them through. Don't jump at something. Go the distance and, and you know, do an outline so you know exactly what you're getting into. That's very important.